Hey, I wanna look right into the camera and welcome everybody tuning in online, our Claremont location, St. Johnsbury friends, and of course, I'm with White River Junction. Can we give it up for everybody? Yeah. So thank you guys for hanging out with us today. My name's Chris, and I'm the lead pastor here at Riverbank Church, and we're in this series called Finding Freedom. If you haven't been around, if you haven't tuned in, I'd encourage you to go uh, to YouTube, and you can, you can catch up on this series. We've been kind of deep diving in what it is to be free as a follower of Jesus, because the truth is, is we live in a world right now where a lot of people seem to be shackled, seem to be uh, in a position where they want to be liberated, but don't know how or don't know what to do. And we hope through this series to be able to empower you to live free. The Bible says that, that we, through Jesus Christ, have been free, and we are free indeed. So we should live free. And so this series is really meant to empower you. Well, today is really a special uh, message. Um, I want to introduce to you a friend of mine. Uh, and I would say um, he's kind of become more than a friend in that he's my counselor, um, a little backstory. A few years ago, I was navigating through just seasons in my life where I realized, like, you know, I don't really have someone that I can talk to, that I can unpack my stuff. Because the truth is, yeah, I'm pastor. I have pastor in front of my name, but I'm still Chris Gepner, and I'm a human being, and I have issues, and I want to navigate through. I want to grow through them. And one of the best things that you can do as someone who wants to grow is to invite people into your life, to speak into your life, to give you wise biblical counsel. Well, Brian is that person in my life. And for the past almost three years, he's been uh, a, my, my counselor, my, my personal counselor. And so over this time, um, I, as preparing for this series, I said, you know what? Brian would be an amazing voice to discuss the idea of depression, anxiety, and mental health. I'm not a professional on that, and he is, and he agreed to come. So will you do me a favor, Riverbank Church, from all over our locations, White River Junction, wherever you are, can you give it up for my friend, now our friend, Brian Neal. Can we give it up for him? Wow. Well, thank you so much. It's excited to be here tonight. Uh, Chris, thank you for inviting me. Um, Chris and Penny, they've been taking care of me. You know, I, I got here, I arrived uh, yesterday, and I, I have to tell you, I went to the car rental place, and they said, I'm sorry, Mr. Neal, your, your car is not, not available. I said, oh, man, I, I'm, it's okay, I'm cool, I'm laid back, I don't, whatever you got. And they go, well, we're going to give you a Toyota 4Runner. Now, some of you living up here, and I grew up in New England myself, you would think, that's no big deal, like Toyota 4Runner, right? Well, I have three cars. They all have a bazillion miles on them. So I was excited when I get into this 2021 4Runner, right? And so I'm coming down this road. I think you guys call it like no man's land from 89. I'm coming from the airport down here. And I, it, this smooth ride, right? I don't hear a sound. I've got the radio on. I look down, I'm going like 95 miles an hour. <laughs> I'm sorry, honey, I almost got a ticket. Um, but, you know, just so happy to be here, uh, excited. I've been thinking about it. I've been praying about this message uh, for weeks now. And, uh, in fact, I dreamed about it the other night. And I was telling Pastor Chris last night as we went to dinner, I said, you know, when I dream about a message, God's going to show up. Um, and uh, so I'm super excited. You know, um, White River Junction, first time here. I did fly to Lebanon Airport, um, so a little bit of backstory for myself before I get going. I've been in aviation my entire life, and then 15 years ago, God placed it on my heart to become a counselor. So what did that look like? I quit my six-figure job. I packed up my wife and kids. We moved to Florida for me to go to grad school. We didn't know anybody, didn't know anything, and we went on this adventure. And I got to tell you, it's been a blessing ever since, because I get to enter into people's stories every day. They get to share with me. I, I sometimes get what I wouldn't have got that day from them in, in our conversations. That's exactly how it's been with Chris and I. You know, like you said, three years ago, Chris was brave enough and had the courage to share his story, and I entered into that story, and since then, we've got a great friendship. In terms of my family, just to give you a little background, I have been married 30 years last week to my beautiful wife, Julie. Yes. Yes. 
exciting. We actually went away for the weekend without any kids. So it was very exciting. Um, I have six children. And uh, yeah, I know. Wow. <laughs> right? Wow. Uh, ages 27 to 7. And people go, wow, how does that work? And, uh, and that works, uh, yeah, when I'm turning 60 in uh, next month. So um, pray for me. Uh, but uh, I have four biological and, uh, and I have two adopted children, and um, they are both seven-year-old boys. So when you come to my house, buckle up, because it's going to be exciting. Um, it's just a good time. And so we're blessed to have them as a part of their forever home. Uh, so we're excited. So we titled this message, Stepping into the Light. And it's for two reasons. You know, Chris and I were talking about it. And stepping into the light, one is an action step. So taking that step, and I'll talk more about that. And the other part is light. That's the solution. And as Pastor Chris has already mentioned earlier um, today, that it's going to take an action, and we want to step into the light. Jesus is the light, and that's where we want to go. In fact, Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, And there is our hope. That will be our grounding scripture for today. Have you ever been lost? Anybody ever been lost? I grew up in Maine, as I said, um, and one of the things that we would do growing up is we would go for a hike, right? My mom would say, get out of the house, go for a hike. So we'd go for a hike. On this one particular day, my uh, siblings and I decided to go for the hike, and we were probably only about a, maybe a mile you know, out into the woods, um, but we, we managed to get lost. And we were really lost. We were scared. And we started running through the woods. And it was winter. It was getting colder. It's about 3 p.m. If you know what in winter around here, right? 3 p.m. starts getting dark. We were crashing through streams. Water is filling our boots. We were scared. We were desperate. We were lost. Finally, we made it through the woods. And we came to this, what looked like a field that we we were familiar with, and we knew, well, you know, we're not that far from home, right? We're not that far from home. Here's the field. We're good. The trouble is, and you guys can probably uh, be familiar with this, is that it had snowed previously, and we had about three and a half feet of snow on the ground, but there was a hard crust on top. I was about eight or nine, so I was about maybe a little over four feet tall. Every step I took... I fell through the ground or fell through the snow. I'm up to snow up to my neck. My siblings are trying to help me. Little by little, we can't go anywhere. We're desperate. We're struggling. And then in the distance, we see the headlights of a car. My dad had been out looking for us. And we said, now there's hope, right? And somehow we were able to get to that car. He brought us home. I still remember to this day how much it hurt when my mom put us in the tub. You know, if you've been out in the cold for a long time and you get into that warm or hot water, it's hurt so bad. And I'm sure we all had hypothermia. But the reason I tell you that story is because I know, for a fact, there's probably people here that have been lost and have been desperate. And that's what it feels like when we enter into anxiety and depression. You see, anxiety actually comes from fear, and a lot of us have the fear of the unknown. And with that fear comes anxiety, and then comes depression. Now, I wanted to talk about this thing called mental health, because I think for a long time, we haven't talked about it enough in the church. It's kind of been this thing on the outside. And I don't know if it's the word mental that takes a bad connotation, but I think the time is right. You know, I think with God's grace and his timing, I think the time is right for us to talk. And so tonight, to be honest with you, I just want to have a conversation with you guys. Now, I'll go through a lot of the notes and what I have in front of me, but I really want to have this as a conversation because it's time to have a conversation, you know. Right now, a lot of you have been through what we all went through in the world, this thing called COVID over the last year. You know, never in probably most of our lives, and, you know, I'll be like I said, turning 60 next month, I've never experienced something that lasted so long 
You know, it was going to be two weeks, then it was going to be two months, it's a year and a half. We've all known people that have gotten sick. We've all known people, in fact, I know people that have passed. It's this overwhelming thing that's just dragged on. And that's just one thing that can lead people to a place of depression. You know, before the pandemic, one out of every 10 people would say they had a depressive episode. After the pandemic, it's one in four. So if you look around this room, and even for the people at home, one in four. That means a lot of people that we know have been battling with this thing called depression. They may not call it depression, but we've all been battling it. What's really interesting is that you would say that the largest group that falls into depression is 18 to 25. You know, they did a study uh, not long ago, and they ages 18 to 25, young adults, 80% would say they're unhappy. And it kind of makes sense because a lot of people are lost today. And so I'm hoping that as we kind of go through, you're going to be able to see where we can find the hope. And that hope is in Jesus. That hope is in God. God is omnipresent. He's always here and he's always with us. You know, a lot of times people talk about feeling blue. Ever hear of that? Like blue, I'm feeling blue. I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling blue. Well, you know, in Chris Hodges' book, Out of the Cave, which just came out, and if Chris Hodges, if you don't know who he is, he's the lead pastor of a very large church, Church of the Highlands. And he came out and, again, he communicated that he was fighting depression. And he references one possible origin of this term, blue, being tied to a maritime history, perhaps for the 17th or 18th century. During long voyages, the ships would sometimes sail off course and lose their bearings, typically because the ship's captain might have died. Nearing an unknown or unscheduled port, sailors would raise a blue flag or paint a blue band along the vessel's hull to signal those on shore that they were lost. They were communicating that they were lost. They didn't want to be mistaken for pirates or hostile invaders, Chris says, fired upon because they were merely off course. If this is indeed the origin of the phrase, it, it refers to feelings of you know, being out of sorts, and, which in turn leads to fear and distress. I tell you this because people often ask, why do they have depression? And sometimes it takes a a looking back at what they've been through, what's happened to us, to really understand how we got there. You know, being a Christian doesn't make us a special kind of human, right? We're not exempt from the general experiences that happen in our life, including getting depression. Having a relationship with Jesus doesn't instantaneously take us away from that or prevent us from having depression. It does give us great hope, right, that we can break the chain, as Pastor Chris illustrated a couple weeks ago, and he can help us out of depression. Those struggling in mental health are no less spiritual, no less strong than the rest of us. We're all just simply human. The message I want to share for you today is, it's okay not to be okay. It's okay not to be okay. And now's the time to be able to be able to talk about that. So where does depression come from? Are we born with it? Do we catch it? How, how, how do we end up having this thing called depression? There's really two types of depression. One is organic, and a lot of people here probably have heard the term chemical imbalance. That's one type. And the other type is situational. With organic or clinical depression, this chemical imbalance, many people ask, why would God allow this? Why would God allow people to have that? And I don't, I'm not going to spend the time to get into a theological conversation about that. I'll, I'll leave that for Pastor Chris. He's got a whole other message on it. But for us today, I just want to tell you that I believe 
that God created a perfect world. It was perfect in every sense. But then as the fall came, we became imperfect. And we won't be perfect again. So we're going to have things like depression. We're going to have things like cancer. We're going to have sickness. We're going to have struggles. But the hope is that God has been the same from the beginning. He's the same now, and he's going to be the same in the future. He sent us Jesus to give us that message, right? And so the hope that we find is in God. And part of what I want to talk about today is how do we allow God into our struggle so that we can be free, free indeed. Situational depression can happen from past trauma, stress, relationships, right? And I want to introduce a concept tonight that I think most of you will get because I think we've all been there. A couple years ago, God gave me this idea of what I call stacking. This is a stack. And the stack really represents those situations in our lives that when we put them on top of each other, they just become overwhelming, right? Our stress level goes up. I mean, we've all been there, right? Even as a parent, I have six kids. I come home from work. It's been hard. A lot of things going on thinking about finances, kids are doing something, and what happens? We snap, we're irritated, we get angry. This is what happens when things stack up on top of each other. We have this overwhelming sense of emotions. We just feel like we can't take it anymore. It's kind of like this. If I gave you one of these boxes and they weighed 20 pounds, and I said, you got to carry this around the rest of the day, I gave you another box, that's another 20 pounds. Carry that box, we got 40 pounds. Most of you, you might be able to do that. But I give you another box, 60 pounds, and I tell you, keep carrying it. At some point, you're going to feel so overwhelmed, right? It's going to take so much energy. You're just not going to be able to take it anymore. And you're going to be like, I'm done, and you're just going to drop them. That sense of being so overwhelmed, It's how stress builds up in our lives. And when you get to that place of just, I can't take it anymore, that's when we fall into these depressive episodes. And so I think when you look at those, that's what happens on the outside of us. That's what affects the inside of us. So what happens on the outside of us affects what happens on the inside of us. It's those experiences that we have in life. And we've all been there. So what do we do? How do we handle that? Well, people handle it differently, right? Men and women handle depression differently. You know, a woman might fall into a very sad state, be tearful in her home with her friends. Men, let's face it, it's different, right? We get irritated angry, we feel trapped, we just want to get in the truck and drive until there's no more gas left. Right, right, guys? We just, we're done. We can't take this anymore. And so I want to know, I want you, I want you to know that, again, another message today is that you're not alone. 16.2 million people in the United States will say they have depression. 16.2 million. We're not alone. But we're going to look at some stories here. And one, I want to to talk about David. And most people know about David. You've learned about him in Sunday school. He's a guy with one stone, took out a giant. But we don't often think of David as having depression, do we? We think of him as a mighty warrior, Right? A man after God's heart. But he had a lot of struggles. He had a lot of battles. And what I like to do is just begin by going through a psalm. You know, during the past couple of weeks as I was preparing for this message, you know, I went to the book of Psalms. I started to think about David. 
What would his life have been like if he was in depression? What would he be doing? How would he have handled it? And the scripture kind of shows us and paints that picture for us. I'm going to read from Psalm 143. My enemy has chased me. He has knocked me to the ground and forced me to live in darkness like those in the grave. I'm losing all hope. I'm paralyzed with fear. I remember the days of old. I ponder all your great works and think about what you've done. I lift my hands to you in prayer. I thirst for you as parched lands thirst for rain. Come quickly, Lord, and answer me, for my depression deepens me. Don't turn away from me, or I will die. You can kind of see, right, and hear those words. David was in despair, but what did he do? Let's read the rest of that. Let me hear of your unfailing love each morning, for I am trusting you. Show me where you walk, for I give myself to you. Rescue me. From my enemies, Lord, I run to you to hide me. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your gracious spirit lead me forward on firm footing. For the glory of your name, O Lord, preserve my life. Because of your faithfulness, bring me out of this distress. In your unfailing love, silence all my enemies and destroy all my foes. For I am your servant. You know, when we look at the New Testament, we see that Paul was also in in depression at times. And he writes about it in 2 Corinthians 1.8. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And yet we thought we would never live through it. The Greek word for despair in those verses literally means to be utterly at loss, to renounce all hope. When a person's depressed, they lose hope. Furthermore, one might think that Paul never felt bad about his past once he was saved. We all know how he came to be saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. But Paul goes on on the rest of this message. Verse 9, in fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God, who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. You can see how these start to balance each other. We've got David in this struggle, and what does he do? He leans on God, right? We have Paul, who's in a struggle, and what's he doing? He's leaning on God. Both men in different time frames, with different struggles, but what did they do? They both leaned on God. Again, I would remind you, the opening scripture, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. So how about people today? So we see the story in the Bible. We see these heroes struggling. We see what they did. When I was preparing for this, I had my Bible app, and I was looking for devotions on depression, anxiety, and I ended up and I landed on one, and it was about a a woman named Julie Thomas. And Julie had written a book. It's titled, Hope Inside Out, Approaching Depression with Purposeful Hope. I just love that title. And this book is about her five-year struggle with depression. And it started with a traumatic event. A traumatic event was actually the birth of her child. She, you see, she had postpartum depression, which affects many women around the world. 
but she just couldn't get out of that. And yet, she couldn't tell anybody. And if there's one thing that I hope you take away today is that we want to be able to talk to people about these things. See, she couldn't. She couldn't go to her small group. She was ashamed of what she was doing. They, they, she thought, they, I'm supposed to be the leader of this small group. How can I be battling with depression? I've just had a beautiful baby. How can I be battling with depression? And so she didn't mention it. She didn't talk. She just kept it inside, and the darkness grew stronger and stronger. Again, if you're looking at Psalm 143, darkness allows us to hide. And that's what was happening with Julie. You know, it actually got so bad that one night she had trouble sleeping, so she started to go for these walks. But one night she was so desperate that she ended up walking outside, no shoes on, in the middle of the night, raining. And her her husband woke up, didn't know where she was. So here is her husband puts the two two kids in the back seat and drives around to find his wife, walking around aimlessly at night. It was at that point that she knew she had to do something different. She had to take a step. And she knew she had to look to God for this. But here's the twist. A lot of us, a lot of other people might say, hey, here's a great scripture. It's going to give you hope. And so she would look at these hopeful scriptures, but she still felt empty. And as a Christian, she really struggled with that. What's going on? Where's my faith? But then she started to look at something different. She started to go back to the stories and to the heroes like David and started to look at how he was struggling. And then she learned that it wasn't about that something had to change immediately. It was that she had to understand, call out, acknowledge that she was in a struggle, and she had to call on God during her struggle. And that's the biggest difference. When I meet with people every week, sometimes they want to come in and have a quick fix, right? I, have, I had a, a couple call me last week. They said, hey, uh, we'd like to get some couples counseling, maybe one or two, and then that'll be good. And I said, yeah, probably going to be more than one or two. Right? I said, might be like 12. 12. See, sometimes we just want, in this society that we live in today, we want the quick fix. Julie realized, though, it wasn't going to be a quick fix. It would take her five years to get out of that pit. But it was five years that she learned to understand that God was with her. God was with her before her baby was even born. God was with her during this time, and God would always be with her. That's the type of God we have. That's the type of Jesus we have. That is the promise that he gives us. We need to step into the light. I don't know about you guys, but I have, with my six kids, they all have different requirements at night. Some like to be tucked in a certain way. Some like a drink of water. But I feel like they all wanted a night light. A light. A light in the darkness. Look at lighthouses, right? I come from Delaware. We have two beautiful lighthouses right off the coast of where I live. Those lighthouses are there. Why? Because they're guiding us. Guiding us to a place. Guiding us home. Guiding us to safety. It's the light. Again, one of the points I hope you take home today is that we need to take a step towards the light. And so how do we get out of the pit? How do we get out of the pit of depression? It's one step at a time. The biggest challenge in escaping depression will be your will. We talked about soul care. I think it was a couple months ago. Chris and I did a combined teaching on soul care and what that means. You know, the soul, the mind, the body, the will. You know, when we're in depression, when we're anxious, we're really a tortured soul. At that point, we, just, we know something isn't right, and we just feel so stuck. We feel like we're in prison by our own emotions. 
It's one step at a time. In this battle for the soul, we need to believe more than ever, right? More than ever that God, through Jesus Christ, can walk with us and help us lift ourselves out of the pit. You probably heard that you have to see it to believe it. You've heard that. I have to see it to believe it, right? Our faith actually requires, right, for us to believe before we see. It's the cornerstone of our faith that we have to believe before we actually see it. But in today's society, especially with social media, so many people are unwilling to believe in anything unless they feel it. Everything we do, the images, the movies, social media, the post, right? We end up having to feel it before we believe something. And I would challenge us today, it says, don't rely on how you feel before you believe, right? Don't rely on how you feel before we believe. Everything that we do, our ability to get out of depression, our ability to get beyond and get free from this prison is going to rely on our will to take a step forward, right? Stepping into the light. We started this, this message today on stepping right into the light. There's an action step there. It's going to take courage. You have to be brave. But if you're willing to take one small step today, then you'll be that much closer to getting out of the pit. So let's walk walk through what the journey might look like. First of all, we have to admit to ourselves that it's real. We need to call it out. So you remember the the stack that I talked about earlier? One of the things that you have to be able to do is is unstack and unpack each of the areas in our life. Because if you can just make one box, if you will, right, one area of our life, Guess what? We've all got finances to deal with. And we've got family as well. But is there a loss? Right? Is there a loss that you haven't worked through? Is there grief? Is there unspoken grief in your life? You know, for 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 some of us it might simply be that our parents got divorced when we were young. And we've been holding on to that. I was talking to Pastor Chris earlier. We were talking about parenting and the struggles that we have with parenting. And, you know, one of the things that, that happens in our life is that we draw a picture of what life is supposed to be like. And sometimes things come up and it's like someone ripped that picture up. In divorce, that happens a lot. I see kids and parents, especially teenagers, they come to me. They had a picture of what it was supposed to be like for their parents. It was a mom and a dad and a cat and a dog and a brother and a sister and a white picket fence. And things like divorce and other trauma in their life, it's like ripping the picture up and you give it back to the kid. That kid becomes an adult and has never processed through loss. It's going to start affecting the rest of their life, as they start to to stack things on top of each other. So maybe now it's time to look at your stack and see what's, what's there. Maybe it's time to unstack and unpack the things that are going on in your life. Talk to somebody. I mean, I tell my people all the time, my, my couples that I see, my clients, You can't over-communicate how you are feeling, right? If we can only be in a world where we stop saying you, 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 and it's I, 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 I feel this way, and we start to do that, and we start to communicate, you know, 
Pastor, Pastor Chris was willing to share his story. And like I said, I, I wanted to enter into that story. Maybe there's somebody that you know that you want to share your story. Or maybe you're the person that needs to be the one that's going to help that person by listening. Be willing to enter into people's stories. Be willing to share your story. We made a connection, like Chris said, it was almost three years ago. And now we have this relationship where he can come to me and I can come to him. Don't let the darkness of shame, guilt, or loneliness keep you from meeting with somebody. Another action step is journaling. I have to be honest with you, I was never a big journaler. But then I finally realized that through journaling, I can actually have a conversation with God. I can, I can start speaking with God. And so here's, here's a tip on journaling. Write down, take a page and you write down what's truly on your heart. And I'm okay with you put down whatever words in whatever language you want to use. But then save about a third of the page at the bottom. And on the bottom of the page, that's when you ask God to speak to you about what you just wrote. Now we're putting our story out there. We're asking God to enter into our story. And I believe with everything in my heart that if you are brave enough and take the courage to write those things down and then look for how God's going to answer you, that you're going to see God work in your life. And that, in our counseling world, in our clinical world, we call that a cathartic episode. That's a release, and we get to release that to God, and you're going to find yourself free, free at last. Another great step is therapy and medication. Now, before everybody throws me off the stage and I start getting really bad emails and texts and everything else, um, medication, my view of medication, is that it can be used as a tool. It is one of the resources that we may have. Now, a lot of people might say, oh, medication, I'm not going to go on medication well, I'm here to tell you, and I've seen it happen in my practice. When somebody is so overwhelmed, so depressed, that they tell me they don't want to live anymore, it might be helpful to have them take some medication or at least talk to a doctor. In those cases, I'm on, by law, I have to tell them they have to go to the hospital. And here's, here's a reason why it can be helpful is that if a person is so deep in a depression or is having constant anxiety attacks that they can not even function on, on their day, to me, it's, it's likened to a, a kid who might have ADHD and it comes to my office and bouncing off the wall. They can't receive the counsel that I want to give them. And so when somebody uses the tool of medication, they should also use therapy at the same time. In fact, the studies would show that if somebody's on a medication, you should also be receiving therapy. And I'm not saying that to promote therapy, but the studies would say that the effectiveness of the medication doubles because you're not just hitting the symptom with the medication, right? You're hitting both the physical part and the mental part at the same time. And sometimes that's what somebody needs. The other step would be what I call pick up your mat, right? You remember the story about Jesus and he heals the man and says, pick up your mat and go. Pick up your mat and go, right? Do something different. I have clients all the time that they'll come to me and we're, we're working through a particular situation. I had this one woman, she was an executive for a company. She had Serious, serious anxiety and depression. And I said, listen, one of the things I want you to do is I want you to start something new in your life. And she says, well, I don't have time. I said, I really want you to make the time. She goes, I don't know what I'm going to do. I go, well, do you have any hobbies? 
She goes, I have no hobbies. I go, you have no hobbies. She goes, I have no hobbies. I go, well, I'll pick something. She goes, I don't know. I go, all right. I said, here's what you need to do. This week, I want you to go to Michael's, and I want you to pick up a paint-by-number set. And she's like, paint-by-number set? I go, yeah, pick up a paint-by-number set. I go, just do it, trust me. So she goes off, the next week she comes in, and she's got this big smile on her face. She never had a smile on her face. And she pulls out her paint-by-number. She goes, I did it. I'm like, that's awesome. Here's why I wanted her to do it. When you do something outside of what you normally do, your brain starts to shift, right? We start to see things differently. I'm always trying to get people to do something different, right? Change your world, change your brain, you know? When she was using the paint by number, she was using her sight. She was using her tactical feel. She was concentrating on the numbers, blue number two. So all those things lowered the stress hormones for her. That allowed her, again, to be in a position to receive the counsel that we were doing. So there was a method to the madness, if you will. She went on to become a painter. She took pastels, she took oils. She had something where she could go and breathe for a moment. And that was her road to recovery. And lastly, I would say serve. And I don't say serve because we're here in church and that's a kind of a Christian thing to do. Everybody should serve because I'm not talking about necessarily serving in church. I'm talking about serving other people. Maybe serving your family. Maybe you come home from work and instead of being, receiving, you ask your spouse, what can I do for you today? Yeah, I call that the power of the question. What can I do for you? And then once we start to exchange things back and forth, again, it starts to change our world, starts to change our thinking. Some other resources that we're going to put on, on, the, on the app that they talked about earlier would be the Abide app, Abide, A-B-I-D-E, Abide. It's a Christian medi- uh, meditation. So now we've got medication, whoa. And now I'm talking about meditation. So again, no more emails, please. Um, but Christian meditation. This is where it's an app that will just walk you through scripture, maybe tell you a story, plays music. I got to tell you this morning, I did it. And I actually did one on clarity in chaos. And it was in First Peter, and it just the narrator just walks you through the scripture and then asks you some questions about how you would find clarity and chaos and what your chaos looks like. Let me tell you, it was an unbelievable time with God. And then another resource, of course, the Julie Thomas book, um, and then Hope for Mental Health. A lot of you may know Rick and Kay uh, Warren from Saddleback Church. They have a ministry called Hope for Mental Health. Their son passed away uh, several years ago after a battle with depression and took his own life. But and I quote here, it says, this is from Pastor Rick, your greatest ministry will flow out of your greatest pain. And that's what they've done. And so I would encourage you, if you're battling with depression or anxiety, go to their website. It's a lot of great resources, great teachings. Uh, Kay Warren does a lot of good teaching on YouTube, and I think it would really encourage you. Bottom line message, don't let your problem become your prison. Don't let your problem become your prison. I have one last story for you. Many years ago in the city of Chicago, lived a woman who struggled with depression and anxiety. She had a good friend who talked to a a therapist and said, listen, will you go by and talk to my friend? She's battling with depression, never leaves her house. He goes, sure, yeah. So he goes over and and he uh, knocks on the door and she answers and sure enough, it's really dark, dreary, drapes her clothes. She hasn't left her house for, for days and for weeks. And he goes in, he starts talking to her. He enters into her her story, and she starts to tell him what led her to this place of depression. But over in the corner, he sees one small light. 
and it's in a room. And he says, can you tell me what's in, the, what's in the room? And she goes, oh, that's my flower room. I used to grow lilies. In fact, I have one, one lily plant, like an Easter lily. He goes, well, show it to me. And so he goes in there, and her face starts to light up. And he goes, you know, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take that lily down to either the retirement home or the hospital and give it to somebody. So she does. It takes courage. It takes a strong will. It takes her stepping out. And she does that. Years later, after she passes away, there's a full-page ad in the Chicago Tribune called The Lily Lady. She had ministered to thousands of people in Chicago over her life by simply taking a step. You know, she was never depressed after that. She had to believe. She had to take a step into the light. So the takeaway, if you took nothing else from today, would be, one, that you know you have a God that loves you, has always been there for you, always will be there for you, and you can go to him in a time of struggle. Two, that you're not alone. Remember that number, 16.2 million people fighting depression. You're not alone. And know that you have to move. We have got to move. We have got to take a step forward, little by little. And it's going to be a journey. But we know through the promises of Jesus that he did something great for us. He left us the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, uh, verse 15, talks about that I will never leave you. I will leave with you an advocate, a counselor. He was talking about the Holy Spirit. This is a promise of Jesus Christ to us. If we believe he is who he was, we should also believe that his promise would be that he would leave us with somebody, the Holy Spirit, that would be with us forever. To me, that was a game changer when I read that scripture. It's become my life scripture. So right now, I'd like, to, I'd like to pray for everybody today. If you close your eyes for just a minute. And I'd like to ask if you would take a bold step with your eyes closed. If you're battling with depression, anxiety, any mental health issue, if you would just raise your hand. Just raise your hand right now. I'm not even going to look because I know that there are hands going up here and at home today. And I just want to pray for you right now. Lord Jesus, you see these hands. You see their hearts. I would just ask that you would give them the strength to take a step, that you would give them the courage to turn towards the light, that you would give them the relief that they need. You know their story I would ask that you give them the courage to start having a relationship with you if they don't know who you are. I would ask that you would just right now, in the name of Jesus, give them a healing touch. Give them a sense of peace. Give them a sense of understanding who you are, that you can always, we can always go to you. Right now, with these people in their hands in the air, Lord, you see who they are. I just ask for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Brian. Can we give it up for Brian Neal? Thank you so much. And I just want to thank everybody uh, for just tuning into this, everybody online, Claremont. What an honor it is to have my friend in here to share this in, in a way that I never could. Um, and I'm, I'm just so appreciative of that. And uh, I appreciate the time that we were able to pray. And, you know, right now, it's an opportunity for us to reflect on our own lives. And so um, maybe you came in today, you're watching online, you're at one of our locations, and this whole idea of battling um, in the darkness is real for you, and there is no hope. You've never had hope. Jesus has never been an option. Well, I want to give you the opportunity to step into the light for the very first time. It's real easy. It's not that complicated. I, I think we complicate this with religion and we complicate this with morality. 
But the truth is, is you being honest about yourself. And I think this message causes us to do so. If you're living in the darkness, you, you've recognized that it's not just depression, anxiety, and maybe mental health issues, but it's a lot of other issues too. We all have them. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of God and his glory. That, that means that every single one of us, including me, have done wrong things. We've told lies. We've stolen things. We've, we've slept with people we shouldn't sleep with that on our spouse. I mean, we've done all kinds of stuff, right? Well, the Bible identifies that as sin. And, and Brian even mentioned this in his message that the world God created was perfect, but we jacked it up, right? Well, we would all be uh, real honest and say, yeah, I'm a part of the mess that the world is. I, I'm a sinner. I am, you are. And the Bible's real clear that, that our sin causes a break in relationship with God. And maybe that explains a little bit of the darkness that you are experiencing. You feel far from God. You feel distant from God. You've never even had a connection with God. Well, that's what sin does. But the Bible goes on and says this, that it's not just that sin or wrongdoing or missing the mark causes a break in relationship with you and God, but that sin actually has a consequence greater than that. It says in Romans, for the wages of sin or the consequence of sin is death. That means this, that you and me have a natural consequence that we're all going to face, and it's called death. Like 10 out of 10 people will die. But it's also bigger than that. It's bigger than that in that you and me were created with eternity in mind. Did you know that? In the house, did you know that? You're created with eternity in mind. The Bible says that God stands eternity on our hearts. Because we know that there's more to life than, than these 70, 80, or maybe 90 years that, that we're going to have. So without our sin forgiven, it's not just that we have a break in relationship with God and we die, but that break in relationship when we do die, because we have eternity stamped on our hearts, we would be separated from God eternally. And this pains me to say it, but would be separated eternally in a literal place called hell. I know that's a heavy statement. I know many people don't like it. I don't. But can we just be real? Maybe you're here today, you're watching online, and you're like, Chris, you just kind of said that if I don't have my sin forgiven by God, then I face eternity separated from him in hell. Yeah, that's a problem. But can I tell you that there's hope? Just like Brian was speaking today, that there's hope if you're in, uh, in darkness of depression, anxiety, and there's mental health issues, do you know that there's hope eternally? Not just now, but eternally. And that scripture says, for the wages of sin is death. It goes on, it says, but the free gift of God is everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus is the solution to our sin problem. He came and lived a sinless, perfect life, died on a cross and paid the price for your sins and my sins. He did for you and me what we could never do for ourselves, not through religion, not through morality. And the Bible says Jesus and history tells us that Jesus was buried and three days later, he conquered death and hell by raising from the grave. Jesus Christ conquered all darkness. Jesus Christ conquered all of the consequence of our sin when he erupted from the grave. And you can know him now. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be rescued from the consequence of your sin. You're watching right now. You're in the house at one of our locations and you're like, Chris, I want to say yes to Jesus today. I want to mark this moment. I want to begin that journey towards the light. I'm tired of dwelling in the darkness and in the unknown. Well, I want to give you the opportunity right now with every head bowed, with every eye closed, wherever you are, you're online, you're on your couch, you're in the, you know, you're in the basement working out, you're in Claremont in the theater, wherever you are. If you want to say yes to Jesus today, I want to give you the opportunity right now to begin that relationship with Jesus. I'm going to count to three. And when I get to three, I'm going to invite you just to quietly raise your hand wherever you are. One, the Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be rescued. Believe. Two, today is the day that you can believe. You don't have to put it off anymore and you don't have to stay in the darkness. You can begin stepping to the light today. 
And if that's you, three, I want you to raise your hand right where you are. Just raise your hand right where you are. No matter where you are, Claremont, you're online, raise your hand. White River, raise your hand. So here's the deal. If you have your hand up and you're at one of our locations, there's someone at the end of your aisle that I want you to connect with. Just look right at them. And I want you to hang out with them for just a few minutes. They're going to get something in your hands and help you better understand what it is to follow Jesus. Now, if you're watching online, here's what I want you to do. I know you have your hand up. I want you to look up. Maybe you still have your eyes closed. I want you to do me a favor, and I want you to text these two words, respond now to 94,000. That's it. Simply text the two words, respond now to 94,000. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for this amazing time that we can lean into this idea, this maybe often uh, uh, times we don't talk about mental health and, and depression, anxiety. God, I just thank you that we can talk about it and we can confront these things head on and take steps to the light. I thank you, Lord, for all the great things you've done. And I believe, Lord, that you have even greater things to do. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope that this message encouraged and challenged you to grow in your walk with God. If you wanna stay up to date on new messages each and every week, make sure you hit the subscribe button to be notified. Here at Riverbank Church, we are on a mission to reach people with the message of Jesus. And if you would like to partner with us, go to riverbankchurch.com forward slash give or click the giving link in the description. We love you, we're praying for you, and we hope to see you next week.